it's a great honour for me to be here um, to deliver the Stephen Livingston lecture to you tonight. And I'd like to thank Fanula for her um, for her kind introduction. Um, I only met Stephen once. Um, I had read his work, um, but I waylaid him as a, a young human rights lawyer in London at, at some event where he was speaking, trying to bring the gospel to, of human rights to a frankly rather sceptical audience. Um, and I waylaid him afterwards and was sort of gushing with enthusiasm. And he was he was a delight um, and very quickly worked out, of course, where I was from. We did the Great Irish Triangulation. We, you know, were unable to identify cousins. But, you know, we managed to he managed to place me. And it was um, it was actually quite inspiring because it was a it was a it was a contested event and uh, he was formidable and brave and incredibly eloquent and 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 that was my only in-person en encounter with him but I'd like to um mention that um I should also say since it was announced I was I've been doing this lecture I've been inundated with emails telling me how fantastic Stephen was and in particular what a fantastic teacher he was in fact I'd just like to say I have three emails from three law professors yesterday telling me how inspirational he was and how I needed to read some Felix Cohen before coming here and giving a lecture in his name. Those of you who knew him, that I'm told that will resonate. Um, in coming here to give the Livingston Lecture um, and coming to Queen's, coming to Belfast and to talk about human rights, I'm conscious there's a bit of a Coles to Newcastle scenario going on here. Um, but... I am supposed, to a certain extent, I've been involved in some of the more interesting debates ongoing in London as we speak about human rights law. I've, I've, I'm regularly summoned to uh, defend the European Convention on Human Rights in, in somewhat sceptical rooms, the type of room where I encountered Stephen um, over 20 years ago. And uh, so in a way, I wanted to talk about this particular topic because it's a topic that's increasingly been openly and explicitly debated, and not just in London. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I, I, I gave it to Conal, who's organizing this lecture, as a topic around two months ago, and then with increasing horror, watched it becoming more and more relevant with each passing day, uh, which required at least three separate rewrites of this paper as we went forward. Um, so at the very least, whereas I am engaged in bringing coals to Newcastle, um, I am at least hope that I'm engaging with something that you'll think uh, that you will think, perhaps unfortunately, is at least highly topical. Um, we all know what human rights are. We know that they're a, a sort of interesting combination of abstract principles whose content is, is fleshed out in people's minds and, and, and in terms of actual law and practice by the existence of actual, if you want, agreed instances of human rights violations. So we have a mixture of abstract principles fleshed out by reference points to specific types of acts which act as sort of core cases, core definitions of violations of free speech or discrimination or torture and so on. And then you, 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 you set up this dialogical interactive unfolding process between the abstract principle, you're triangulating, as I sometimes tell my students, between the abstract principle, the actual core established scenarios where people generally agree human rights have been violated and the facts of an actual case, okay, or an actual situation. It's an inevitably fluid form of law and practice, okay, where the underlying concepts of dignity and equality that sort of motivate human rights thinking inevitably come bubbling through to the surface. It's also a form of law and practice that's become incredibly embedded in our, um, in our, uh, in our societies, globally speaking. Um, the the it's the last thirty years have often been described to borrow a famous phrase from Roberto Bobbio, the age of rights. Bobbio was writing that in nineteen ninety six, a long time ago. Now, by then, he could almost take it for granted that we were in an age of rights. Um, the the interesting constitutional sociologist Chris Thornhill 
writing in 2014, describes rights as foundational for contemporary constitutional orders. All over the world, there's this assumption that the state should play, should protect rights as part of its core function. Um, and this, this, this concept that rights are central to, should be central to law and practice is constantly being reiterated. And Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, rights should be front and center in counter-terrorism. And, and rights talk remains central to debates. Uh, I have to say, when I was writing this paper one afternoon, uh, Fanula suddenly propped up in my Twitter feed, getting endless repeats because of what she had to say about the unfolding human rights situation in, in Gaza by way of, um, by way of uh, an example. However, the idea that we're living in a... In an, in an age of rights, where rights are the main order of business of the constitutional state are one of the main orders of business, and that rights occupy some sort of sacrosanct, untouchable status, is now heavily contested, and may indeed, frankly, be a thing of the past. Um, very, very recently in the UK, as you'll all know, in, in you, we've, 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 we've seen direct questioning of key elements of the post-1945 um, human rights architecture. Sula Braverman writing in the, the, the former Home Secretary, former Attorney General, writing uh, last week in the Telegraph, described both the European Convention on Human Rights and the Geneva Convention as outdated. Um, Juliet Samuels uh, writing in the Times last Wednesday, human rights treaties have had their day. Um, in fact, there were four separate articles last weekend in 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 the UK press circling around those themes. Um, you sometimes go to international conferences and discussions over the last couple of years, and people sometimes frame this, by the way, as a particular UK, a particular, sometimes even a particular English set of issues. Um, I have to say that simply isn't true. Um, I could give you a pan-European tour, I could give you a pan-global tour. Um, all I will say is that it's in that I'm currently resident in Brussels. The Flemish nationalist parties are coming out with rhetoric about the convention that would easily match anything within the Conservative Party in the UK. And the relevant Belgian just the Belgian justice minister has repeatedly been held in contempt of court for refusing to give effect to court orders requiring the accommodation to be given to um, uh, um, a, a, a asylum seekers whose applications for, asi for asylum has been refused, but who the Belgian state has not been able to return to their originating states. Okay, That's just Belgium, which for all its oddities is actually one of the more stable states in Europe. So that, that's just a sample of the fact that this is um, becoming a global phenomenon. The, the, the human rights project more generally is being increasingly, um, increasingly challenged. And it's been challenged increasingly in a very particular way as a project that may have been useful in particular circumstances, that may have had its own time, that may have performed certain useful functions in the post-Second World War era, OK, but now requires systematic and fundamental rewiring. That's the argument put forward by the likes of Suella Braverman. You know, she says, and she's quite explicit about this, the Human Rights Project was quite useful during the Cold War. And there are elements of the Human Rights Project which still remain important, useful to protect free speech and so on. But we're in a very different era. We're in an era of mass migration, large scale terrorist threats, large scale threats to national security. We need a fundamental new architecture in which individual rights are deprioritized in favor of more commutarian communal concerns, protection of borders, um, expression of the people, protecting um, the sort of national sovereignty, national self-determination, and so on. And these are arguments which are obviously increasingly echoed across the world. Now, what's interesting as a human rights academic is that all this, this concept of rights being outdated specifically, has interesting echoes 
has been interesting echoes in what various, um, I'm sorry, various um, well-known and prominent, um, shall we say, critics of human rights from the left have been saying for years. Um, those of you who are human rights academics, I was uh, putting this PowerPoint together and I was chuckling to myself at mentioning um, people like David Kennedy, Samuel Moyne, and uh, Matty Koskaneni in the same PowerPoint slide as Suella Braverman. And um, they would be trusted, if you're not aware of their work, they would be horrified by that particular, um, that particular combination. But what is interesting is that there are commonalities going on here. There is a, a, a shared depiction of rights, as of, of, of the human rights project as we know it, as something that was developed post-war, that hit its full stride in the 70s, 80s, 90s, that served perhaps quite useful purposes in, in Europe, in the transition to Central and Eastern Europe out of the Soviet bloc, globally helped the transition to democracy in Africa and Latin America in the 80s and 90s, um, and which was perhaps quite a, a niche invention which sort of resonated with the zeitgeist in the 80s and 90s, but now is outmoded and subject to serious problems. Uh, uh, Mati Kaskaneni likes to call it um, the uh, human rights so 90s is what he has described. He's given several talks on this theme. And that captures the essence, I think, of what's going on. There is a, um, a framing of human rights um, that are increasingly being framed as outmoded, as sort of, you know, no longer being um, what we need in current circumstances, as fossilized, as, as ineffective, not delivering on their promises, as being old hat, you know, there's not something perhaps that a cool law academic coming out of Harvard would be doing these days. Um, bed blocking, by what I mean by that, is that they prevent, that they, they hog the limelight and they prevent other emancipatory narratives from a left perspective or other narratives from a, you know, from a sort of more conservative perspective, perhaps other concerns about communal solidarity, protection of borders, um, national sovereignty, all these concerns from 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 um, acquire from 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 also pushing into the limelight, um, their uh, attention hogging, that they're ossified and ossifying that rights discourse is sort of quite backward facing, often shaped by the concerns of a previous generation, problems of a different era, that it's not up to speed with the problems that countries now face globally. Um, that it's small C conservative, that it sort of, uh, you know, works in favor of old established elites in academia and elsewhere. You know, it's nice for sort of uh, law professors who are not so young anymore to come and pontificate about human rights, but it sort of gives a status and an authority that um, is no longer suitable. Um, and in general, the basic argument reduced to a nutshell is that rights are out of sync with the current democratic populist anti-elite zeitgeist, that they are obsolete now, you know, that they are out of time. Now, Evan McNally here has written an absolutely brilliant book on human rights and time. So I'm going to acknowledge the brilliance of that book, some of the best things I've read in ages, um, and, and just flag it up that it's an absolutely fantastic book. And I'm a bit wary even to talk about human rights and, and, and time. Um, but what I think this, this, this narrative of human rights being out of time, of being obsolete, of being outmoded, is now um, quite firmly embedded, okay? It's firmly embedded in how governments talk to each other. It's firmly uh, embedded in um, popular debate, okay? It's firmly uh, embedded in academia, okay? And it's firmly embedded among the judiciary and civil servants, and the diplomatic corps, across the world, okay? So, so uh, you know, a judge like Jonathan Sumpton, many of the arguments he makes about the need to break with existing human rights structures, again, use this framing of being outmoded, okay? And this isn't just a wealthy global North trying to insulate itself from migration patterns um, type of discourse, by the way. Um, if, you, if you read the, um, if you read what, say, um, 
some of the um, intellectuals who uh, lend support to the BJP in, in India have to say their framing of these issues is actually remarkably similar. That, that you know, that rights are highly individualistic, that they sort of are use, you know, that they may be played, they may be played a reasonably useful role in the in, in fighting colonialism and transitioning out of the colonial period and 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 pushing back against Indira Gandhi's state of emergency in the 1970s. But that they are in they are excessively individualistic, excessively ossifying. They, they, they give too much power to the elite practitioners of the art, those who can speak with authority on the language of human rights, and pontificate about decisions of human rights committees and so on. Um, and that they, it ends up being an ossifying, individualistic, elite reinforcing discourse, which is no longer particularly suitable to the trusting new dynamics of a new, more communal Indian body politic. Um, you can, I can give you other examples. Um, some people are more blunt than others. Uh, Javier Millet in uh, Argentina, um, uh, like the, the human rights lobby was part of his list for the chainsaw. You may have seen the, the an exciting video of him waving a chainsaw down the street in Buenos Aires for all the cuts he was going to give to the sort of stagnant, dead, ossified elites holding back Argentina. And the human rights lobby was, was part of the, uh, the chainsaw ensemble, so to speak. Um, so we have this critique that's propping up across the globe and across the political ideological spectrum, okay? In different forms, people wouldn't, dis wouldn't agree with each other. And it's not a totalizing critique, by the way. No one is standing up, well, some people are, but very few people are standing up and saying, let's get rid of human rights. But the argument is that it basically needs reining in, it needs supplementing, it needs to be sidelined, it needs to be de-emphasized, it needs to be prioritized. It needs to be made part of the background furniture the inherited um, fittings from previous generations, which may play some useful role, but is no longer um, up to speed. Okay. Is this a fair critique? Um, I think there are aspects of this critique that will resonate. Okay. Um, you, you, you see it sometimes, for example, when you see a discussion about, well, have human rights much to say about environmental crisis? Okay, about climate change. Um, and of course, you can point to elements of human rights discourse, the, the important work that certain UN special rapporteurs do, for example. Um, you can point to particular legal cases that are important and valuable. And you can say, but human rights is doing some really good work there. But you can also point, if you want to, and of course there's a degree of selectiveness in some of these criticisms, but you can point to other parts of sort of human rights law and practice and say, look, this isn't, this isn't doing us much good. This, this, this isn't contributing anything of much use. Um, and, and it is interesting, um, and there's certainly no doubt as well, in addition, that um, there, that if in a way, Human rights is struggling to articulate or to, to, to sort of give expression, if you want. Human rights talk is struggling to give expression to this, um, this anti-democratic, and sorry, this allegedly democratic, populist, anti-elite zeitgeist that we're dealing with. The, 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 the sensation that we all could do with a good democratic shake-up, okay? People on the right have their own concept of what that shakeup would involve. People on the left have their own concept of what that shakeup will involve. People in the global south, global north, wherever, have their own concepts as to what that shakeup will involve. But there is this sort of sense of, well, we could do with a shakeup. We can do with change. And that human rights often manifesting itself in the form of lawyers who, who frown when confronted with exciting new ministerial initiatives and sort of give you reasons why it can't be done, that human rights is part of, as I said, part of the background of furniture there. Um, there is this, 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 this concern, so to speak. Um, and it is interesting that you can certainly point to elements of human rights law in particular that are perhaps struggling to gain and keep traction 
when confronted with contemporary social dynamics. Um, I'm giving a presentation in Brussels next week to the European Network of Anti-Discrimination Experts. It's a presentation I give every year um, where I summarize the exciting developments when it comes to equality and discrimination law in the case law of the European Court of Justice. Sorry, the Court of Justice of the EU. Okay. And when I started giving this presentation six, seven years ago, I was scrambling to shovel in exciting case law into my half an hour presentation slot. Okay. Um, I have a real problem in a week's time. I have two significant cases. Okay. Both of which are frankly quite technical. Okay. And there has been almost no significant race discrimination jurisprudence in particular reaching the Court of Justice of the EU in the last five years, even though many of you will know this, that EU law prohibits race and religious discrimination and employment and occupation and race discrimination, access to goods and services across the board. And we all know that race discrimination is, an, is, 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 is a big problem area in Europe. And yet that particular aspect of human rights law isn't generating many cases, it's not generating much legal breakthroughs, and let me be very frank, it's not necessarily having much of an impact in framing political debate in Europe, pushing it mildly. Okay? So you can point to these aspects where, rightly or wrongly, rights talk, human rights discourse, human rights law and practice, call it what you want, isn't impacting is losing traction, um, not keeping pace, um, being left behind. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, but I think there is certainly, you can certainly point to areas of human rights law and practice and say, there's a problem here, okay? And there are those who are trying to jumpstart progress. It's absolutely fascinating reaching, watching climate litigation framed in terms of human rights claims reach the major international courts now. We have the tribunal, we have decisions expected next year, probably, you knowing the pace of courts. Um, tri the Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, International Court of Justice, ECHR, Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Okay, big decisions coming down the line, a lot of excitement. Okay, my, my inbox is inaudate with, with fabulously super smart young academics writing energized articles about how important this um, this, 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 the, these cases are, and, and, and you can see the motivation there. The idea is to try and give an impulse to, to human rights law in, a, in what's becoming an increasingly important area. And this is a global phenomenon, by the way. Okay. So there are attempts, if you want to sort of like re-energize human rights law in practice. Okay. Um, we'll have to see how that goes. There are real tensions, I think, here, and I'll come to those in a moment. Um, but you can you can almost see in some of that enthusiasm, you almost see a sense of things have to change. There needs to be new energy, new, and if that energy doesn't come, then human rights law and practice is going to look increasingly outmoded, even in the eyes of the enthusiasts for human rights law, let alone all those national governments and national politicians across the world who don't like it at all. Um, more recently, current events in Israel and Palestine have led to um, a real debate as to the status of human rights. Uh, the, the historian, uh, very interesting historian, critical historian Slobodan Quinn, no Donegal relations, I think, um, though I don't know, actually, um, he, he commented on Twitter around a week ago, apologies for the Twitter quote, but it's where the action is happening at the moment. Um, among many other things, we are reaching, we are witnessing the end of human rights as a consensus language. Now, what he meant by that in relation specifically to events in Israel and Gaza, in Israel and Palestine, is that, um, the, um, that human rights aren't biting, okay? That people are increasingly not having a discussion in terms of human rights, okay? And that the, 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 the appeals for people to respect human rights coming from Fanula, coming from Volkow, Turk, Turk and others are not having the impact we would like. And, 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 and that the language is even not being used sometimes. 
but people to start and even engaging, let alone justifying. There's a big, you know, Kuskaneni and others have always criticized how national governments often like to justify their dubious practice by using the language of human rights. What, what Quinn is now arguing is that people aren't even bothering using human rights to, um, to justify their, their actions. Um, I have problems with that, but I'll come back to that in a moment. All of this has generated certain interesting um, new directions in human rights law and practice. I've talked about the reinvigoration push. There's two other pushes I'll mention very briefly. You have those who call for a return to core competency, so to speak, who, who, who call for a, a new human rights minimalism, which Horst Hamoun in his book in 2019 articulated very well, and um, basically saying that, look, human rights has become radically overstretched. Much of the backlash that's going on is in response to this massive overextension, that human rights began life as a sort of narrow set of protective uh, norms very much focused around uh, political life, protecting free speech, and absolutely fundamental entitlements like right to life, freedom from torture, and so on. And now it's become massively overextended. The backlash reflects this overextension. Everyone will be much better retreating to the core competencies of human rights and keeping them there. Okay. Interestingly, that resonates with many of the critics I've mentioned on both the left and the right, okay? Who tend to sort of say, yes, human rights does have some sort of residual, an important residual, but quite residual. Um, John Tasoulas and others have, have made similar calls. Um, I'm very skeptical of that position, mainly because if you look at current human rights controversies, they often touch on absolutely core fundamental issues. I mean, at the moment now in the UK, there is the big question, will you know, the government get legislation through the Lords and Commons to override determ determination by the Supreme Court that Rwanda is not a safe country? Okay, I don't think they will, but I think they're out of time. But this is the debate. It's non refoulement it's a fundamental human rights issue, a core competency, and yet directly in the middle of current contestation. Um, there's also another position, which is what I call the, the doubling down on the expansiveness of human rights, a sort of uh, almost a total co comprehensive politicization of human rights. Um, some of you may have encountered this, some of you may not. It's, it's, it's quite fashionable among critical uh, certain schools of critical thought in academia, okay, where you basically say human rights are political, they've always been political, they're political appeals, let's just recognize them as pure political constructs. Um, look, there's a long tradition to this line of argumentation. Um, my own sense is that once you start giving up on the notion that these are communal, collective frameworks to which we've all signed up to, then I think your, let's just say, let's just say whole scale politicization of human rights effectively nullifies their impact. I, I'm already seeing some people whose work I really admire, who like to talk about the need to politicize rights, when confronted, and they're generally on the left, when confronted by Sula Braverman, saying, let's politicize rights. They go, oh, no, no, that's not the type of politicization I meant. No, that, that's not, you know, that's, that's the wrong type of politicization. That's insufficiently emancipatory um, politicization. It's a nothing position. Because, of course, Suda Braverman isn't there going, I am having an, ins you know, I am enslaving people with my rhetoric. Everyone thinks their, their, their politicization of rights issues is emancipatory. From a from a from a, a conservative perspective, pushing back against rights is emancipating national sovereignty, freeing up the democratic will of the sovereign body politic, which is too often trammeled by lawyers and suits worrying about human rights standards and NGOs. Okay, so you know everyone gets to frame their politicization of rights as emancipatory. Um, so I do find this notion of sort of total politicization of rights, which is quite fashionable in certain quarters, um, to be. Uh, unstable and unsustainable, okay? Um, so where does this leave us? You know, I've said I, I sort of admire those who are trying to push new life into the existing package. 
but I do wonder how how they will fare in the current context. Um, I have noticed those who want to go back to core competencies. It's like a corporate strategy. You know, when a company has overexpanded, you sort of shed your extra loads. You, you sell off your non-profitable bits and you go back to your what's your original best at. That's, that's the sort of thinking. I'm deeply skeptical about that. I, I don't think it's unsustainable. I, I, I don't think it's sustainable. I don't think it's an answer to the problems everyone's facing. Um, I'm also completely skeptical about the, the doubling down total politicization effect. Um, so where does this leave us? Um, I think it leaves us in a, in a context where human rights are both deeply embedded in law and politics, nationally, internationally, across the world. They're there in every constitutional order in some form or another. Okay. Um, they have histories and resonance, often different from place to place across the world, but often powerful resonance. They often remain majorly motivating. They often remain elements of a legal system and a political system that have real power and appeal. They're unavoidable, so they're embedded. They're unavoidable in the sense because they're embedded. Governments, lawyers, civil servants, activists, NGOs, businessmen, and so on, you're always going to trip over these embedded bits of our law and politics all across the world. They're, they're unavoidable. You're not going to extricate yourself from human rights structures um, at this point. Um, the, the attempt in, 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 uh, in, in um, the attempt to replace the Human Rights Act with a, a Bill of Rights uh, was a very interesting experience, by the way, for those of us who were in some of the rooms where its detail was being discussed. Um, the, 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 uh, let me be very frank, the, the Conservative government found in effect that it actually couldn't get rid of the Human Rights Act because, for example, it would mean ripping up 25 years of case law on mental health and disability for example, it just would almost become impossible. So they ended up with a, a dog's breakfast of a bill, which just shows almost in a way how embedded and unavoidable rights are. Um, they also remain indispensable. And let me, let me, and this is where I start pushing back slightly against the, they're tired, they're contra the zeitgeist, they were hot in around 1991, but they're not so hot now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they may not be as fashionable as maybe they once were, though it depends who you talk to. But there's no doubt that they, they remain indispensable, okay? Indispensable to contemporary law and politics, to, to uh, the functioning of nation states across the globe, the functioning of the international uh, order, okay? Um, they're, they're, they're indispensable in the sense that once you are committed to the idea, even in theory, even if you don't really mean it deep down, but once you are sort of formally say, I recognize that everyone has a certain, every human being is entitled to a certain level of dignity and a certain level of equality, with equality often being the major motor, by the way. Once you make that step, then you're into the discussion of what does that entail? And that inevitably brings you onto the human rights um, uh, into your human rights discussion and the need to talk about human rights, engage with human rights. Um, back before people used to talk about human rights, but Hermann Heller writing in the context of Weimar Germany in the 1930s, he basically said that once you recognize the formal equality, the equality of status, Jeremy Waldron others put it, once you recognize the equality of status of all people, you are in the discussion of what limits exist on state power, how are states constrained, you're, 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 what do states need to do to make that dignity and equality of status real, okay? And everyone is formally committed to equality and dignity, formally, let me emphasize formally, right? Lots of people don't mean it, but they're formally committed. To it. So human rights are, if you want, indispensable in that, in that state. We're all, uh, what, what Frank uh, Mitchell Mann, Michael Mann describes as internal commitments. Every state across the world, or almost every state, is internally committed to respecting the, this, this concept of dignity and equality. So 
no matter how much you have this framing of rights as sort of past it, as, as, as sort of outmoded, as, as, as a small C conservative, as elitist, anti-democratic, however you want to frame it, they remain embedded, unavoidable and indispensable. Okay? They also remain a perennial work in progress. What do I mean by that? I mean that new contexts, new situations always bring new challenges, new and new demands for rights to be rethought and rearticulated and the meaning of rights to be worked out. Okay. This again militates against the sort of this idea that there is a sort of useful back to basics residue of rights that we can retain, that they can, you know, be quite useful around election time, you know, to allow opposition leaders to speak. But you know, they, they have that sort of like backdrop role. That's the notion again. I think that you can go back to that sort of minimalist core and 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 not worry about new rights contexts and what how rights, for example, play out in an era of mass migration, or how rights play out in a context of um, algorithm usage, massively online presence. How rights play out in the context of climate climate change, mass battles for resources, mass tension around resources. I should say we don't have mass battles yet, perhaps. Um, the idea that you can sort of relegate rights to a sort of you know, back operation, you know, they might do some background reasonable role strikes me as, 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 a, as, a, as a naive and fundamentally unrealizable vision. Okay. So we're left with rights as embedded, unavoidable, indispensable, and a perennial work in progress. They are, you're, you're sort of stuck with them, no matter how much you would like to get beyond them. Okay. And I think personally, that's a good thing. I think they, they, um, they deliver something I'm looking at cool now. Yeah, they, and I think this is a good thing because, I mean, I'm not going to stand here. The paper goes in for a while while rights are a good thing. I'm conscious that there are probably not that many people in this room who are, you know, sort of human rights hostile. Um, but as well as being embedded, unavoidable, indispensable, constant work in progress, they also, it seems to me, um, because of this relationship with dignity and equality, they you know, they're umbilically linked with status equality and the wider democratic project. Okay, and I'm defining democracy in as broad terms as you want. Okay. Um, in, in the sense of um, once you're sort of committed to formal equality, to people ruling together in democratic assemblies, and, and then you add on separation of powers, rule of law, and all of that, you're into the rights project and you need rights to complete that picture. Okay, I, I like to say that sort of uh, rights are what democracy owes itself by virtue of its own inherent inadequacy, um, which is very long winded now that I say it out loud. Um, but basically, um, you know, for democracy to make itself re to realize itself, it needs a concept of rights. Okay, so, so this is all intertwined. Now, what is that going to mean in the future? It seems to me that we're going to be in a situation now where rights are sometimes going to struggle to achieve tra traction, where it is true that rights may have lost some of their status as a consensus language. Or at least put it this way, as Frederick Megare has said, um, where different actors across the world are increasingly willing to get, put new radical understandings of human rights on the table and have a debate in those lines, okay? The, the era where you couldn't say mean things about the Geneva Convention is over, unfortunately, frankly, um, where, you know, the, the, the days when the ECHR you know, where, where, you know, I was reading recently the debates on incorporation of European Convention on Human Rights into UK law back in Hansard in 1998, and absolutely fascinating. Because everyone goes, oh, the ECHR is lovely. International human rights law is lovely. You know, we need to think about how all this works in the British constitutional tradition. But, you know, the convention was for the vast majority of people talking about it, not the problem. The problem was how do we make this work within British law? We're now in a radically different place and not just in Britain. Okay, in many, many other countries. Okay, French interior minister is cheerfully saying he'll deport who he likes and pay any fines the ECHR imposes, the European Court of Human Rights imposes, for example. So that's some of the rhetoric again, going back to that point. So we are in this era where the sacrosanct status that human rights used to enjoy 
and the tie it had with sort of economic progress, with liberalization, the, the, the sense that this is all part of the project of modernity, that you have to formally subscribe to all this. And you have to be seen to respect all of this as as, as an inevitable part of being a, a, a sort of modern wave of the future. That era is gone. Rights are going to be far more contested. It's going to be far more political pushback, far more legal aggression. Um, and that's inevitably going to make the job of human rights courts very, very, very difficult. Frankly, I wouldn't want to be on something like the... I, sorry, I'll rephrase it. I, I think it would be very, very difficult being a judge on the transport court. Um, or on or on a national courts hearing issues um, at the moment because this is a massive area of contestation and it's not something that judges like and you're inevitably going to have judges I think be ruling on human rights matters in ways that recognize those limits okay you're inevitably going to have judges very concerned about legitimacy okay um, and that may mean that with the sacrosanct status of human rights increasingly Coming contested. That may mean that legal routes for vindication of human rights become much more problematic depending on context. And you get less gains than perhaps would have been the case 10, 15 years ago if you're an idealistic lawyer trying to push for change. However, there will be an ebb and flow here. Okay. There will be uh, different concepts of rights. There will be different discussions. There will be times when rights will bite in ways that do attract popular approval and delete approval. There will be good days and there will be bad days um, because rights are going to remain in play. Okay, Because they're, as I said, embedded, unavoidable, indispensable and a constant work in progress. They're going to remain in play. And for me, they still perform absolutely essential, unavoidable functions. So they're not going to go away but it may be a much more rockier road ahead than than the sort of bright, relatively smooth future that um, I think we all had in our minds when when I met Stephen briefly twenty plus years ago, and when Stephen was 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 was, was lecturing, where where um, it seemed to be that there was this 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 narrative progress that is now much rockier, much darker, much more contested than perhaps would have been the case twenty years ago. But the road still has to be traveled, basically. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. listening to